So welcome, welcome everyone to our talk. Uh, we're so happy that you're here in person joining us as we journey towards a joyful destination, deployment. And also welcome to all the folks who are tuning in to this recording. People of the future, hello, we welcome you, thank you. Um, your feature, picture this, your feature is complete, your application is ready. You wanna share your hard work with the world. So how do you pick the optimal deployment process? Where do you even start? By the end of this talk, you'll be equipped to begin navigating the CICD landscape and you'll leave with resources that will enable you to get started quickly and begin testing in your own environment. So, who am I? Hey, I'm Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ponce. I'm a software engineer on the search infrastructure team at Airbnb, and I'm based in Portland. I joined Airbnb in 2017 in the customer support org, answering calls from hosts and guests. Hi, that was me, I helped you. And then I transitioned to engineering in 2021. When I'm not on my computer or volunteering, you can find me running long distances very slowly, singing everywhere I can, and being active in my community. Uh, this summer, I was a torchbearer for the Paralympics in Paris, and here's me holding my Paralympic torch back in Portland. And it's important to know that all opinions in this talk are mine, not of my employers. Let's meet Muriel. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, as she said, my name is Muriel McCabe. Um, I am a customer engineer with Google Cloud. Same thing applies, opinions are mine and not my employers. I've been at Google for about five years now. I'm a recovering sysadmin. If there are sysadmins in the room, please raise your hand. Um, was a DevOps engineer as well for many years. So, you know, those of you that also live in YAML, those are my two fur babies down there, Orion and Andromeda. Um, and outside of just doing various things in the community, I also like to spend a lot of time outdoors while I am not doing tech stuff. Last year, I accidentally signed up for a triathlon, as one <laughs> does, uh, and I've been kind of hooked since, so that's been another big part of my life. So today's focus is deploying containerized applications to Kubernetes. Ta-da! <laughs> Uh, we only have 30 short minutes here today, so we're really going to be going through just the fundamentals of CI-CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment, things that are in this world of continuous delivery. We're going to focus on fundamentals and a high level of everything because we don't have too much time. We're going to do an overview of some common open source tools. Uh, we're going to share out a deployment demo environment that we had. We were going to do a live demo, but also realized after going through all the content that there just it would be too much speed run. So <laughs> we're going to be doing a little bit of speed run through some of the tools and also talk about some considerations for how to choose which one of these tools uh, makes sense for you. And for everyone who's not sure what Muriel just said on that last slide, don't panic. This is a beginner-friendly talk. No previous knowledge of any of those things she just mentioned is necessary to hang out with us. So uh, let's take a quick survey with clapping, because I love clapping. Who here considers themselves a beginner? <laughs> Welcome, beginners. OK, and who here considers himself an expert? Welcome, experts! Hey, and, and who's somewhere in the middle? Who's somewhere in the middle? Hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. OK, so here is a link to our project demo app. Uh, and it includes the material that we're going to cover in this talk. This is a work in progress uh, forked from another open source application repo. And it provides examples for many different tools and the deployment methods that we'll cover in this talk. Okay, oh, you changed the slide. Sorry, sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so first, let us start with DevOps. And you can see here our beautiful infinity symbol for DevOps. It is a portmanteau of development and operations. And I've always wanted to say the word portmanteau on stage. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, so there are a few things that fall into this DevOps cycle. I'll talk first about these two key components around the inner loop and the outer loop of development. And think of the inner loop as basically everything that a developer
developer will do on their local workstation. So you're coding, you're um, committing, you're working on a feature, you may be doing some local build and test, everything that uh, you can kind of be heads down on. And on the outer loop, that's when you're actually taking that code and everything that you're working on and pushing it out to the world, making it available um, for you know, everybody else to be able to use. And so essentially, this idea is how do we get the development side, things that are happening locally, and the operation side of applications running in production to be able to be a collaborative process. And you can see this is really an infinity loop and not linear, it's iterative. Uh, you kind of go through this planning, coding, building, testing process, and the deployment, release, operations, and monitoring over and over again throughout your application lifecycle. Uh, and if anybody today has felt overwhelmed by the millions of tools that are out there, um, you know, as mentioned, we're going to be focusing on the basics. I am very sorry if we did not mention your favorite tool. There are other things that we wanted to cover. There are probably updates that have happened this weekend to some of the tools that we are this week uh, to some of the tools that we're talking about. Um, but we just kind of wanted to highlight that there are a lot of considerations when you're looking at deploying your application. Everything from your hosting environment through what your version control system is going to be, how to manage your dependencies, things like your database, your security, secure software supply chain, how you're managing your secrets, and so on. Um, and then, of course, you know your CI CD systems, which is what we'll be largely focusing on today. So first, we wanted to talk through maybe a basic deployment process. So in that CI CD world, we're really, as I mentioned earlier, focusing on deploying applications to Kubernetes. So starting out, you're in your favorite IDE. Um, for me, a lot of that time is in Visual Studio Code. You are committing that maybe to a repository uh, where it's version controlled. And there's maybe some build or deploy process that happens, and then it gets sent out to a cloud or a computer. There are actually maybe some humans in the mix there that are <laughs> helping with this manual ferrying of your handcrafted code to its final destination. Well, when you're looking at the Kubernetes world, there are a lot of these other considerations that now come into play when you are trying to release your application. So you're working on your code, but now often within that repository, you're going to have something like a Docker file to actually take that code, package it up into a container image so it is friendly and Kubernetes ready. So that code is going into your version control repository. There is some type of build process happening. And now that image goes into some type of artifact storage. And often, where that image is stored, you'll have some kind of link or reference so that your app knows how to find and pull that image. Um, from there, typically your application configs and all of your fun YAML that you're working with in the Kubernetes world is stored, uh, likely in another repository or other locations, and that then gets deployed out into your cluster or is used to help with the deployment to the cluster, often referencing those images that you have previously built. Somewhere along the way, there are a lot of things like testing and security and so on. As mentioned, this is just kind of a very high-level uh, overview. Two other key concepts uh, is in this world, there are kind of these two paradigms where you have the push method, which is generally imperative. Um, so if you're thinking of like an imperator, right, you are taking and commanding and running these applications or running these commands to be able to take that application and push it out to its final destination. But really what that golden standard is using that Kubernetes resource model of reconciliation is you have this pull-based method, where you uh, which is generally declarative. So you set your state somewhere and say, this is what the application should look like. And then from there, there is something that is running, often in cluster, that can look to a version control repository and say, whatever is here running in my cluster, I want that to match the state that I have previously defined. So why are there so many tools? Um, consider this analogy. So you're getting dressed for your first day of work at a new job. So you pick out an outfit, and let's call that dev. And then you ask your friends what they think about your outfit. Uh, we'll call that version control. And then you probably want to try it on, make sure it fits. We'll call that staging. And then you wear it out, you're going straight to prod, OK? So there's a process that works here. But let's consider this analogy, and let's say your first day new job is ambassador at the UN, okay? 
In addition to those other steps that you're taking, you probably want to consider adding in some other tools to help you, uh, like checking the weather. All right, we'll consider that a developer workflow tool. And what about uh, checking the dress code? That could be your templating, a, a templating tool. Uh, you maybe want to bring a backup sweater in case it's cold. Uh, it might just be cold. So you'd, uh, you'd also consider that your outfit would be viewed by other heads of state and people that depend on you to be the face of wherever you're representing. So you can pick an outfit and go with it and it'll work, but you can easily see that in certain environments, standardizing tools and adding specific configuration may be needed to achieve your desired result. In the remainder of this talk, we'll talk, uh, we'll start with the developer workflow tool scaffold here, and then templating, packaging, and configuration tools, our friends Customize and Helm. And then finally, we'll, we'll compare four different CD tools. So there's a lot to cover about each of them, and uh, the resources will be available at the end of this deck. Uh, so let's start at the very beginning with just a completely manual deployment. And uh, we'll see here for the next couple, we'll be looking at kubectl. The assumption is that you've already got this installed, you're authenticated and have all your credentials for a cluster running locally or running on the cloud. Um, so this is an example of just a manual deployment. Say you've got a good snippet of YAML that you've got from Stack Overflow or whatever, or you really love writing YAML on the fly by hand, you can actually pass that in through standard input on your terminal. And what's happening here is that YAML for your actual uh, file is getting passed in, and here we're using kubectl create. And so that's really an imperative method of being able to set up a resource. Um, you can't change it afterwards, you're just creating. So if it already exists, it's gonna complain to you and say, no, you can't do that, right? Um, so the next uh, few methods of being able to set and send something into a cluster is you have the kubectl apply commands. Um, a note too on that previous on the create, you can pass something in through standard input, but also you can refer to a file as well. Uh, and so here we're using that dash F flag to be able to pass in a file and you can do an application on, um, here we're, we're referring to our sample YAML, the, that where my uh, application, and you can either send in a file or you can send in an entire directory and all of the YAML under that will get applied as well. And so that is looking at more of that declarative point of view because as many times as you apply, it will take those sets of files or those definitions for the application and just ensure whatever the state is in those files, I'm gonna make sure that that is what my cluster reflects. The last thing to note at the bottom is the kubectl run command. And what we're doing is actually passing in an image directly with um, uh, the pathway and some flags and so on. And what that's doing is actually just creating a pod. So um, that's kind of the method where, you know, as folks know, like the, um, you know, you can create deployment services and other resources with the kubectl apply, but run is just kind of for pods, getting an image up and running right away, um, doing some testing and so on. Um, so next, starting to get into our tools. Um, we could spend a lot of time on just scaffold, but we're gonna do a quick, quick overview right now. Essentially, it's this open source tool that was developed by Google, and it's really there for your developer workflow. So when we were looking at that DevOps pipeline of all of the different things that need to happen, um, for those of you that have worked with images and so on, when you're in your development environment, there are a ton of things that need to happen. You need to build the image, you need to tag, push it to a repository, do a lot of things before you can actually test and see that feature live. And maybe you just have one or two components that you wanna be able to update. So the really great thing about Scaffold, it's very lightweight and client side, and you can actually create this uh, Scaffold definition that lives in your repo with the rest of your source code so that a dev coming in can start and really get onboarded quickly to an application. So they clone the repo, um, they can basically just um, run this command and it actually has a lot of flags and parameters to be able to set up your environment and start testing. And it has a lot of really cool features like hot reloading so you can actually be in your environment making updates and say you have like a mini cube or some other cluster running mm -hmm. locally, you can see these features kind of show up live so it really optimizes and accelerates that uh, testing and development process. 
on to Customize. It's a configuration tool. It provides a solution for customizing your Kubernetes resources with no templates, with no templates. Uh, customize simplifies your Kubernetes configuration management by allowing customization without templates. It uses a base and an overlay system, making it easy to manage configurations for different environments like your dev, staging, and prod. You can generate resources like config maps and secrets directly, which is handy for storing your configuration data. And finally, it's great for combining and customizing sets of resources, keeping things organized and flexible. Check the docs for your kubectl version because there's a couple of different ways that you can use customize. So customize key concepts. Layering, well, that's, that's the thing you need to know about customize. Uh, we'll have a base where we define our common settings and developers use overlays to make changes to the base for those for specific environments. And then using patches, we can make changes without touching our original configurations. So in the Where Am I demo app, this you'll find uh, anything starting with the customization.yaml file. So let's take a look. Here's a snippet of the file structure from our demo application. The first concept I mentioned of a base, you'll see in the K8s directory, customization file. The arrow, the arrow is pointing to the resources declared in that file. So deployments, services, config maps, et cetera. The next concept is overlays, which is to manage a configuration variant, like development, staging, and prod, to modify a common base. So in the code snippet example, uh, we're creating overlays for our front end and back end. Uh, an overlay is just another customization.yaml file that refers to the base. So you'll see that um, highlighted in the red under resources on the overlays. Uh, it's referencing the base. And then the patches are referenced in the red. So this arrangement makes it easy to manage your configuration with Git. And we can see in this example that all the resources are written out exactly as they are with no templates. And why is that a benefit? Why would, why would anybody want that? Uh, first, let's talk about templating. A templating pattern in the context of Kubernetes and YAML refers to a method of creating reusable and customizable configuration files for Kubernetes resources. So this approach allows developers to manage complex deployments more efficiently uh, by reducing repetition and enabling dynamic generation of Kubernetes manifests. So customization is template-free YAML. Why would I want that? Uh, because I can see exactly what's defined in the base and the overlays and the patches. I can see it. Uh, and our next tool is Helm, which extensively uses templating. Here's an example. And some teams love that. Why? Because you don't need to manage every, every variant, every variable in every environment manually. So there's advantages to both approaches. Let's take a look at Helm next. Okay, um, so now on to Helm. Helm is essentially the package manager for Kubernetes. So think of it a pack as a package manager similar to apt or yum or brew for those folks that are on Mac. Um, and essentially it helps to automate this process of like installing, upgrading, configuring, um, and managing generally uh, these different applications, but specifically on the Kubernetes side of things. Um, it's very useful for a lot more of the complex deployments. Um, as a note, like Customize is integrated with kubectl, so you can do a lot of stuff natively there, but it doesn't really have that package management feature or kind of mindset as um, Helm does. And actually, some organizations or folks can use Customize on top of Helm where you can say, use Helm to be able to, to pull down and, and get this application in this package and then run some customizations on top of that. But essentially what Helm helps with is being able to manage and version and, and handle all of these dependencies for different components within a larger application. Um, so looking at charts, and as mentioned, you know, one way that this is also very useful is if there is some application that you know you want to be able to deploy in your cluster, you don't want to have to write everything from scratch, you can look uh, for a Helm chart that defines that app and a lot of the dependencies and have a really good starting point that you could then tailor to what you need um, on top of that. So for versioning, sharing, publishing applications, it's very, very convenient. Um, 
And so here is an example that is kind of based off of our, our, our repo where your chart might typically include things like all of the YAML manifest for the Kubernetes resources, the various templates um, for the files, a values file that, that includes the values that will then get injected uh, into uh, the templates and then often some metadata about the charts themselves. Um, and so for setting up Helm, uh, there is a command line tool for being able to use and manage Helm. Uh, so you can do something like if you're on Mac, through install Helm using a package manager to install a package manager. So, you know, back to some infinity loops. Um, and you can do things like do a Helm search to be able to find some different um, applications if you, you pass in the application type and then use that to be able to actually interact with your cluster uh, and pass in the chart and, and install something into your cluster as well. Uh, it's on to Elizabeth. Next concept that all beginners need to know, pipelines. Pipeline, and we'll see it in all the remaining four CD tools that we'll be covering in this talk. So what's a pipeline? A continuous delivery pipeline is a structured We'll call it automated process that facilitates the rapid delivery of software from development to production. So what's it about? It is a set of tasks executed in order. A pipeline has built-in support to help you identify issues for your common CI CD tasks like build, test, and deploy. And it could have both parallel and conditional execution. It creates an audit trail in code, so you have it checked into your Git, and you can see you know, what steps took place when. You see it all laid out for you. And generally, they cover five stages. Uh, source control, build, test, staging, and finally, on to production. Raise your hand if you've heard or used Jenkins. All right, that's everybody for the people watching on the internet. That was everybody's hands. So we'll start our brief tour of CD tools with Jenkins, which launched in 2004. If you can believe it, that predated Kubernetes by 10 years. Happy 10 Kubernetes BT dubs. So what does Jenkins do? It's used to automate the aspects of your software development lifecycle and building pipelines. So some key features of Jenkins is extensibility. Jenkins supports hundreds of plugins, allowing integration with virtually any tool in your CI CD tool chain. Uh, it's cross-platform. Jenkins is a self-containerized, uh, self-contained Java-based platform that runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, Mac OS, any Unix-like operating system. Um, it's got a web interface that includes on-the-fly error checks to help you see what's going on with easy setup and configuration and dis offers distributed builds. So Jenkins can distribute work across multiple machines, enabling faster builds, tests, and deployments across your various platforms. Let's take a look at a pipeline. So something to know about Jenkins, the original, uh, well, as it is right now, there's two different types of pipelines. You can write scripted and declarative pipelines. And both types serve the same purpose, but cater to different needs. So scripted pipelines are best suited for your complex workflows, requiring detailed control and levels of customization. And declarative pipelines, which is a newer feature and are preferred for simplicity, readability, ease of maintenance, uh, especially in standard CI CD processes. So for many projects, combining both approaches by using declarative pipelines and an embedded script block can offer the best of both. Here's an example of a Jenkins declarative pipeline, and it doesn't look like YAML. If, I'm sure you were all shocked. That's not YAML, that's groovy syntax, and I wanted to say that on stage. So let's take a look at our next tool, Tekton. So Tekton launched as part of Google's Knative project and originated as the build system for the Knative serverless workload platform. It was later converted into a standalone project and donated to the Continuous Delivery Foundation in 2019. Tekton runs as an extension on your clusters and provides a set of reusable components for creating your pipelines. So you create and run tasks in YAML, and you can manage runs using its CLI TKN. Uh, it also has a dashboard, a GUI dashboard you can interact with. Some key components to know here about Tekton. Uh, we have step. A step is the most basic unit. That's one operation. A task is a collection of those ordered steps, useful for simpler workloads, such as running a test or linting. 
And a single task executes in a single pod, uses a single disk, generally keeps things very simple. A pipeline is a collection of tasks useful for complex workloads like your testing, building, and deploying of more complex projects. There's also the concept of triggers, which are event-based pipelines. So how do we set up a task run object? This is uh, an example. So we're gonna set up a task run object here. And a task represented in the API as an object of kind task, you can see that in red at the top, uh, defines a series of steps that run in a set order to perform logic that the task requires. And every task runs as a pod on the Kubernetes cluster with each step running in its own container, as I mentioned. So first, you'll make the hello world.yaml file task with a step that includes a small hello world script. You can see it here, and I apply the changes to the cluster and the task.tecton.dev hello created output confirms that the task was created successfully. So then next I run, uh, next I create a task run object. You see that kind task run down there in the red uh, in the hello world run.yaml and apply those changes to the cluster. A task run object instantiates and executes this task and you see that the output again confirms that it was created. And finally, I use the kubectl to get the task run object and check the status of the hello run task. And it succeeded, hooray, on to Argo. So Argo, uh, some folks might have seen there's actually gonna be an Argo documentary, I think, released this evening. So that should be fun and exciting. Uh, there are a collection of different projects that are in this Argo world. Um, but what we'll be focusing on in particular is the CD part, as mentioned, back to the deploying applications um, point of view. Um, so as I said, we're focusing on the CD part of CI-CD. Um, there was an entire ArgoCon, I believe, on Tuesday as well that um, kind of focused on a lot of the topics. But really, I think the big key takeaway is that this was designed with a Kubernetes resource model-centric point of view in mind. So optimized for being able to do things in this very declarative way, where everything is um, using this GitOps point of view. Everything is kind of automated. You're using pull method. You've got things in version control, you've got this loop running within your cluster. So the components themselves can be set up either within the cluster directly on a separate management cluster or you know there are hosted services as well, but you have this idea of having basically your API server that's going to be sitting and running as this custom resource within your server. Um, this repository server that kind of has a cache and clone of, of all of the components uh, or all of the things in code in this application controller as well. So this here, as you can kind of see a workflow, and you can see some of the tools there. There's Jenkins as well. So there's a lot of integrations, as mentioned, um, with, with the tooling that, that's out there. So a lot of this stuff is interoperable, right? You're using, using um, these together. So some of the key resources that live in this world is application. And so this is also kind of part of our, our demo uh, um, repo where you've got the definition of an instance of an application um, and that'll live in your, your source control. You can have a project essentially which is a group of applications. There, there are other resources beyond this that's focusing on the, um, these core ones. Then you have the repository itself and then the manifest uh, two, you can have those depending on what, what flavor of management you want. If you want to have, if you're using customize or helm. Um, or just your straight YAML as well. All of those are, are kind of uh, concepts that work within the Argo CD world. Um, from a setup point of view, it's also pretty straightforward to set up. If you've got your cluster and your resources and you want to just to be able to do a test run, you know, it's actually pretty quick as a couple commands, you know, create the namespace, apply the Argo CD YAML, and, and you'll be up and running with Argo, a few little config steps after that. So there is a command line tool if you want to be able to use that for some automation to be able to um, run and, and execute commands against Argo CD. There is also a full UI dashboard, um, which folks might have seen. It's a pretty dashboard and has, you know, a lot of configuration that can be done. You can see a lot of like reconciliation and everything. And then there is an API as well. Okay, on to my next. <laughs> full circle. As the closing tool for our speed run, uh, excuse me, and on, on our CD tools, 
we're going to revisit our friend Jenkins, this time as Jenkins X. Jenkins X manages multiple environments using Kubernetes namespaces. So introduced in 2018, Jenkins X builds upon the Jenkins automation server, uh, but is built specifically designed for modern cloud environments. So what does this mean? What does that mean? The entire Jenkins X ecosystem revolves around Git. So using a cluster Git re repository to manage installations, extensions, and applications. So by default, Jenkins X uses Tekton. Anybody remember that word? Tekton uh, for cloud native pipeline orchestration, but it can also work with traditional Jenkins pipelines for users with legacy workloads. So it incorporates chat ops functionality, allowing developers to interact with pipelines through comments on pull requests. And we'll see some examples of that uh, in a bit. So Jenkins X offers both a CLI tool, JX, and GUI options for interacting with the system. And for every pull request, Jenkins X automatically creates a preview environment. So this feature allows developers to see the impact of their changes before merging them. Cool. Let's see a diagram. How does this work? So Jenkins X key concepts and a diagram. Source repositories, environments, pipelines. Source repositories are a Kubernetes custom resource which creates the file structure and sets up tools. Environments like your dev staging and prod are also a Kubernetes custom resource in Jenkins X where your application code lives. And we can't forget pipelines. Jenkins X creates pipelines, activities for jobs, and they are also, no surprise, a Kubernetes custom resource scoped to a namespace. Pipeline activities are made up of steps. Uh, a step can have three kinds, stage, preview, and promote. Using single command operations, you can create Git repos, webhooks, and CD pipelines. Uh, let's take a look at some of these chat ops examples. An interesting feature that Jenkins X, we looked at a lot of tools. Chat ops, how interesting. Developers, uh, some backstory, developers use the phrase chat ops to mean operating code changes, pipelines, and Git ops promotion via chat. So more specifically, this is done via commenting on pull requests or on your Git provider website, uh, though in the future, this could be in Slack or maybe in a web console, we'll see. So here's some fun examples. And so the question remains, Muriel, what tool should I use? Well, Elizabeth, and you might have expected this answer, but it <laughs> depends. Um, Oftentimes, some of these tools might be driven and determined by what your organization is already using. And maybe your enterprise is already using all of them or uh, none of them. I mean, some of those choices aren't made for you. Um, but when we were kind of thinking about this idea of bringing joy back to your deployments, uh, if many, any of you are like me and like us experiential learners, we want you to pick up each tool, you know, get hands on, turn it over. Give it a test run, see if this tool brings you joy or maybe some pain, but at least you'll be able to get uh, some experience with seeing what some of the trade-offs and drawbacks are to be able to understand a little bit about what the capabilities are within your environment and hopefully at least have a bit of a picture around where it fits into the development life cycle. And oftentimes, as mentioned throughout our talk, a lot of these tools can be used in coordination with each other um, or maybe in sequence. So, I mean, there is a version of the world where you have all of these tools kind of combined and, and running uh, in one way or another within your environment. Um, so here is a link which will be uh, part of our, our deck and everything afterwards with a lot of the resources. There's a link to our GitHub as well, which is definitely a work in progress. So stay tuned. Uh, we'd love a star and come back to it because you will likely see some updates that are going to be pushed into that repo pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Behold, actual footage of Muriel and I meeting at KubeCon last year in Chicago. Uh, raise your hand if we have met you in the hallway this week. Raise your hand. That's a lot of hands, hey. internet. There's some hands. We met people in the hallway. Uh, so the technical discussions at Con all help us grow and collaborate. And it's an opportunity to connect with people and find your pals. So we met Anna Margarita and Adriana last year after their talk, and they encouraged us to submit a talk last year, and so here we are. So this is our plug, make time to meet people in the hallway track. It will bring joy into your life too. 
Thank um, you. Yes, thank you everybody for joining. We'd love to be able to connect with folks. We would also very much love feedback on our talk, so there's a QR code, so that's very helpful. Um, so we'd love to be able to hear what, what uh, you liked, you know, what tools might have been your favorite. Um, we'll be down here afterwards with stickers and would be happy to talk to you any further and answer uh, any questions, but we really appreciate all of you coming out here and hope you enjoy the rest of your time at Cubicon. And thank you to the conference volunteers and the programs teams, and thank you AV team, and thank you. <laughs> Woo! Yeah.